Okay, so the first talk is relaxation aware heuristics for exact optimization methods in graphical models. So I'm excited to see this work, but it seems to be about improving branch and bound for particular graphical models. So that sounds quite exciting. So let's, let's so I think we should start now with the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fulia. I am doing a PhD at the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment under the supervision of Simon de Givry and George Katsirelos. Today I am here to present you our paper titled Relaxation Aware Heuristics for Exact Optimization in Graphical Models. Exact solvers for optimization problems on graphical models, such as cost function networks and Markov random fields, typically use branch and bound. The efficiency of the search relies mainly on two factors, the quality of the bound computed at each node of the branch and bound tree, and the branching heuristics which determine on which variable we branch at each level of the tree. In this respect, there is a trade-off between the quality of the bound and computational cost. In particular, the virtual arc consistency algorithm computes high-quality bounds, but at a significant cost. So it is mostly used in pre-processing rather than at every node of the search tree. In this work, we identify a weakness in the use of buck in branch and bound solvers, which is that they do not use all the information that WAC is able to produce regarding the linear relaxation of the problem. They use only the dual bound produced by WAC and ignore the rest, which is sad because WAC is able to detect relatively easy and difficult parts of a problem. By eliminating the ineffective decisions caused by this negligence, we significantly reduce the size of the branch and bound tree and become able to use the VAC algorithm throughout the search tree. Also, we can optimistically assume that the relaxation is mostly correct in the assignments it makes, which helps find high-quality solutions quickly. The combination of these methods shows great performance in some families of instances, outperforming the previous state-of-the-art. Here, we mainly work with the weighted CSP framework. It is a more flexible framework than the classical CSPs. For that, we define cost functions to replace the hard constraints we have in CSPs. A cost function is very similar to a constraint, only that instead of allowing or forbidding tuples, it associates cost to them. The cost function which is defined over the empty set is called the nullary cost function and it corresponds to the cost that we pay no matter what solution we have. The cost functions which are defined over one and two variables are called unary and binary cost functions respectively. They can be represented by cost function networks as we can see on the example here where we have two variables i and j with two values in their domains a and b. If I assign both variables to B, for example, I'll have to pay a total cost of 2 plus 0 plus 3, which is 5. So a WCSP is a quadruple consisting of a set of variables, their domains, a set of cost functions, and an upper bound M, which is either a positive constant or infinity. The objective is to find a solution S that minimizes the sum of all cost functions and for which this sum is less than the upper bound M. In our work, for the sake of simplicity, we focus on binary WCSPs. If you look at the same example again, the lowest total cost we can obtain is 1. We do that by assigning i to a and j to any value we want. As I said in the beginning, because we are solving a WCSP instance with branch and bound, it is important to maintain a good lower bound. The C0 constant here serves as that lower bound, since we know that all costs are non-negative. And the nice thing is that it is possible to move costs between cost functions and therefore transfer some cost to C0. We do that by enforcing some different levels of local consistencies, one of which is VAC. The key to improve the lower bound is to transform a WCSP into an equivalent one by moving costs. We say that two WCSPs are equivalent if they have the same total cost for each solution. Here on the left, we have the WCSP we saw earlier that I now call P1. On the right, we have P2, which corresponds to the same problem, but it has a better lower bound. I don't show the intermediary steps here, but if you are interested, please have a look at the references in our paper. 
success. Then how does what algorithm work? Here in the top row, we have P1 again, with P2 that is equivalent. Vec transforms the problem by focusing on the zero-cost part of the problem, shown in the second row, where zero-cost values are painted in green. It tries to see if we can find a complete solution to the problem by using only the zero-cost values. It approximates this MP-complete task by finding the R-consistency closure, shown in the third row. If the green part of the problem is inconsistent, meaning that when we run AC, we end up with empty domains, which is the case for P1, as we see in the bottom left figure, then C0 can be improved. If, on the other hand, AC ends with no empty domains, that stops with C0 as its current lower bound. So P2 is a fixed point for VAC with an improved lower bound. How can we use the VAC algorithm more efficiently then? One fact is that if in the AC closure of the bool of B every variable has a unique value, we have a complete solution with a total cost that is equal to the lower bound. So we are at optimality. Otherwise, if only a subset of the variables have a unique value in the AC closure of the bool of B, we have a partial assignment of cost zero. Such variables correspond to the integral variables in the LP relaxation when the VAC lower bound is equal to the optimal value of the LP relaxation of the problem. This is why we name them the VAC integral variables. So, using VAC integrality, we implemented a variable ordering heuristic. We saw that it does not make sense to branch on work integral variables because when we assign them to their unique value, the AC closure of the bull of P does not change and we have a sub-problem in which work cannot improve the lower bound. So, we simply classify the variables as blue and red, work integral variables and the rest, using the result of the work algorithm, and we avoid branching on blue variables and prioritize the red variables, which is similar to what IRP solvers do with variables that are integral in the LP relaxation. We implemented another heuristic to calculate a good quality upper bound at the root of the search tree before starting to search. Using the result of the VAC algorithm, we fixed the VAC integral variables to their unique value and solved the red subproblem consisting of the other variables with their remaining values in the AC closure of the bull of P to quickly find high-quality solutions. So, to test all this, we ran some experiments. We implemented both heuristics in Toolbar 2, which is an open-source exact solver for WCSPs. We compared our work with CombiLP, developed by Hala et al., which is an open-source algorithm for graphical models, based on similar ideas, and it uses Toolbar 2 as its internal combinatorial solver. We ran experiments on 431 instances, including 30 instances from worms, for which CombiLP is the state of the art. For all experiments, the time limit was one hour. You may wonder why we do not use any ILP solver in our experiments, although we mention linear relaxation. It is because for most of these problems, Toolbar 2 is already proven to perform much better than CPLEX, to the point where Toolbar 2 is already done solving the whole problem, while CPLEX is still trying to solve the LP relaxation. For more details, again, please have a look at the references in the paper. Here we see a scatter plot for the number of backtracks, where we compare Toolbar 2 using default options, with Toolbar 2 using our algorithms. For instances below the line, we have a smaller number of backtracks. It clearly shows that our algorithm leads to a significant reduction in the size of the search tree. Here, we have another scatter plot for the computation times. The gain is still there, although not as significant as it is for the number of backtracks. This is due to an indirect effect that was indeed surprising for us, since there is nothing computationally complicated in our heuristics. We found out that with the branching heuristic, we generate subproblems on which the VAC algorithm converges more slowly, hence the results. Here we see a cactus plot for the Worms instances, 
where the x-axis is the number of instances sold by each method in under one hour, and the y-axis is the time taken for the instance. For each method, the instances are ordered from shortest to longest based on computation times. The yellow line corresponds to the results reported by Halla et al. They were able to solve 25 out of 30 instances. We did manage to improve the default toolbar using different combinations of our algorithms, as you see in the dark blue and purple lines. This way, we solve the same number of instances and perform nearly as well as COMBLP. The best results, however, come from incorporating our heuristics in Toolbar 2 that is used inside COMBLP, and with that, we managed to solve 26 instances, which makes one more. As future work, we would like to implement other sophisticated techniques for MyLP solvers in Toolbar 2, especially some cut generation methods. We also would like to find ways to enlarge the easy part of the problem using ideas from CSP literature to further improve the computation times. Thank you very much for listening, and I will be pleased to answer your questions if you have any. Take care. Okay, great. So we have a few more few minutes to ask some questions. So if there's any questions from the audience, we can ask them now. And then, of course, we can also discuss during the Q&A session. If you have a few minutes, I would just like to ask you, so here you noted that Toolbar 2 is really good for these problems. And yes. with your heuristic, it performs even better. Is it clear why this happens? Like, where does the improvement come from? Uh... Is the architecture of Toolbar 2 that somehow helps? Or Sorry, can you repeat it? Is the, is the architecture of Toolbar 2 something that's really convenient for this problem and then synergizes really well with your heuristic? Yeah, I think the architecture of Toolbar 2 itself is already very helpful, given that it is the state of the art for most of the instances on which we worked. Uh, and um, yeah, it is clear that our heuristics managed to uh, improve the uh, the size of the branch and bound tree and um, yeah for the especially for the worms instances where combi-lp is currently the state of the art uh, well until our paper maybe but whatever um, yeah they are using a very similar approach meaning that they are categorizing variables like they are trying to divide the problem into easy, relatively easy and relatively difficult parts and we are kind of doing the same thing, only this in the context of toolbar. And yeah, that explains the results, I guess. Okay. So I have another question, but I guess we'll go now to Emmanuel's question. He's asking whether it's sometimes better to use Mac less often. True. Like would the heuristic still work? So you either just at the root or occasionally doing search. Yeah. Sometimes uh, it is better to use VAC less often, well, yeah, only at the root because, um, well, we, um, most of the time, we prefer to use an algorithm to uh, find a lower bound during the search that is less complex than the VAC algorithm. But then, yeah, because th the thing is that when you try to use the VAC algorithm throughout the search tree, because it is a computationally complex algorithm, or let's say because it tends to have a lot of iterations, uh, it is very costly to use it throughout the search tree. But then uh, for our case, given that we improve the lower bound even better, and we manage to reduce the size of the tree even more, this kind of pays off like we, we gain so much time that using the VAC algorithm everywhere is not that costly anymore. Okay. Great. So I think I'll also ask you some questions during the Q&A but for now we'll have to go to the next speaker. Yeah thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank the speaker we have some virtual round of applause for the, for, the, for the video and for the question and now let's go to the next speaker on uh, well, we have the one-man paper, which is rather rare. 
So it's nice to see that also happens. And so uh, seems very interesting in a sense that it's uh, the author is dealing with compactly representing many solutions doing search. Okay, so let's start with the Hello, my name is Tiago Serra, and today I will talk to you about enumerative branching with less repetition. Now, the goal of this work is to reduce the amount of branching when enumerating the solutions of discrete optimization problems, such as in the case of integer linear programming. And our approach here is based on the fact that when we're traversing a branch and bound tree, we may take different paths that would lead us to equivalent nodes, in the sense that from each of those nodes, we're going to find the exact same solutions on the remaining variables. And if that's the case, what we would like to do instead is to infer in advance that those nodes are equivalent. And by doing that, we're going to avoid the repetitive work of exploring an equivalent formulation again and finding the exact same solutions on the remaining variables. So in the way that we're setting this work, we're thinking in terms of a branch and bound tree and how to merge nodes to reduce the size of the representation and save time. That is, in fact, what happens when we're talking about transforming a tree into a decision diagram. So in a decision diagram, we merge nodes that have the same completions. So instead of talking about solutions as paths in a tree, we would talk about solutions as a path in a diagram. And then all the leaves can be merged as a single node. And in a bottom-up process, that will allow us to infer when nodes in the, in the, in the other layers can also be merged because they represent equivalent sets of completions. And this is a process that, when applied to a tree or a decision diagram, will produce what we call reduced decision diagram. That's a unique decision diagram for a given order of the variables, in which every node has a distinct completion set, and we know that this is the smallest decision diagram for that particular order of the variables. And in this work, we're going to consider order decision diagrams, which are those in which we're deciding the value of a particular value at each level. So let's say we've started with x1 as the first variable, then x2, and then x3. And when we're always talking about the same order of the variables along every path in the diagram or tree, that makes it easier to identify equivalences. And the benefit of the approach that we're proposing here depends on the extent to which the search is performed on that first search, so that when we're exploring a node in a given level, all the nodes that we have explored in that level, we already know if they're feasible or not and what solution they have. And also, the benefit depends on always using the same order for the variables along the different paths. Now, when we're thinking, for example, in terms of integer linear programming, if we're always branching on the same order with respect to the variables. That means that the left-hand sides of the formulation are always the same. So the problem of identifying equivalence of problems comes down to a problem of identifying which right-hand sides are equivalent. We're just comparing the right-hand sides and we want to tell if they would produce exactly the same solution sets. Now, there, is some, some, there are some work on this topic for the case of a single linear inequality, which also exploits the idea of using a depth first search. And the way that it works is that you have this single non-strict inequality, and the coefficients are integer, and the right-hand side is integer. And this has been considered by Bile and Bio and et al. Uh, so those are two different papers. And later, this was generalized for the case of having discrete decision variables as opposed to just binary ones by Bio and Stuckey. And this study is the work on which we're basing everything that we're doing here. And the way that it works in this prior work is that a linear inequality has right-hand sides that are equivalent. So we can think that there is a, an interval of right-hand sides that would produce an, an empty set of solutions. And then there will be intervals of right-hand side values that we produce more and more solutions. So let's say that we start with this inequality 5x1 plus 4x2 smaller than or equal to something negative up all the way to minus 1. In that case, we always have an infeasible set, but the moment we switch to the next interval between 0 and 3, for example, we have one feasible solution. 
And as we move to the next intervals, we're having more and more solutions. Four to four, we have two. Between five and eight, we have three. And from nine onwards, we have four solutions in this case. And then the way we compute these intervals of equivalent uh, right-hand sides is in a bottom-up fashion. So let's say that we have a node V with a problem defined on variables X1, XI, all the way to XN. The moment we branch on variable XI and attribute different values, we're going to obtain different descendant nodes, all of them having the same left-hand side, defining as a problem on variables XI plus 1 all the way to XN, and different right-hand sides, depending on the assignment and the impact of the assignment. And once we compute these intervals for all of these descendant nodes, we're able to compute the intervals for node V as well, by taking the maximum of these impacts and the minimum of these impacts. And the base case here are the terminal nodes, one for the case where we have a feasible solution, and the other one for the case where we have an infeasible solution. And the meaning of beta and gamma here are as follows. Beta is the smallest integer right-hand side with the same, same set of solutions as we obtained with the node, and gamma is the largest integer right-hand side that also has the same set of solutions. Our contributions in this work are the following. In the case of a single inequality, we show that it's possible to extend this existing approach to handle a broader range of cases. But in the case of a multiple inequalities, that's not so simple. There are limitations on applying the same method, on computing these intervals for each inequality, but we show that there is still a necessary condition for equivalence that we can explore, and also an elimination procedure that we can use to identify a single explored node as potentially equivalent to every unexplored node. And we also have a sufficient condition to determine if this equivalence holds or not. So in the case of a single inequality, the first thing that we can observe here is that the right-hand sides don't have to be integer. So in the way that this procedure works right now, we're computing the smallest and large, largest right-hand side values that are equivalent and they're integer. But, and then the end of one of these intervals is one less than the beginning of the next one. And we could as well just redefine these intervals as half closed intervals. And then, and then in that case, we're covering all the fractional values between one interval and the other. And once we do that, we also can waive the, re the restriction that the left-hand side coefficients have to be integer. Because the reason why they should, have, they should be integer in the previous work is that this allows us to compute this gamma coefficient. But if we're now computing the beta of the next interval, which has a different meaning as the smallest right-hand side with strictly more solutions, this doesn't have to be, these coefficients don't have to be integer anymore. And in fact, we can generalize the type of inequalities that we can handle from the case that's linear and not integer to a case where the left-hand side is an additively separable function and the right-hand side can be fractional. All because we're waiving these requirements and changing what's the type of interval that we're computing. Now we're going to move to the case of multiple inequalities. With multiple inequalities, we might feel tempted to just compute these intervals of equivalent right-hand side values for each inequality on its own. And here's an example that, where that works. We have four possible solutions on these two binary variables, and the same solution separated by both inequalities. So we can compute the equivalent right-hand side values for each one of these inequalities. And it's true that the intersection of these right-hand side values tells us a broader range of right-hand side values that would be equivalent but it's also true that we can, for example, relax one of these inequalities if the other one remains separating the fourth solution. So we can relax the second inequality and have a much larger right-hand side value as long as the first one stays where it is, and vice versa, which means that a single intersection of intervals is no longer sufficient to characterize all the possible equivalent um, right-hand side values. And these intervals that we're computing are no longer independent. So if we're considering a case where these inequalities are separating different solutions, we might end up with an inconsistent, with inconsistent intervals when we do these computations. The lower upper end sometimes might be smaller than the lower end because we're looking at, at solutions that are not feasible. And sometimes they're satisfied by one inequality and not by the other. 
But one thing that doesn't change, and this is where we, we start our work with multiple inequalities, is the fact that the lower end of these intervals is always the same. And if you think about it, what this lower end is computing is the smallest right-hand side value that you can put in each one of these inequalities, such that you're not separating any of the feasible solutions. In other words, we're making these right-hand sides as small as we can while not separating anything. So they should ideally be active for at least, so this, each one of the inequalities for, with this corresponding right-hand side values will be active for one of the solutions of the solution set. That provides us a way to characterize a given solution set by the tightest right-hand side values. And that brings us to a procedure that we can use to, ident to, to identify potentially equivalent nodes. So let's say that we start with two nodes that are distinct and they are explored nodes and we know the tightest right-hand right side values for them. And let's say that we have an unexplored node that we're trying to match. The necessary condition tells that the right-hand side of the unexplored node, let's say rho, has to be greater than or equal to the tightest right-hand side values, beta, that we got for the explored nodes. Otherwise, we don't have as many solutions in U as in V bar or V double bar. Now, we can also use a procedure called dominance elimination to observe that if these right-hand sides are not exactly the same for the explored nodes, sometimes they're larger for one in one of the inequalities for one and smaller for another one. That implies, for example, that one of these nodes has a solution that the other doesn't have. And as a consequence, if U has as many solutions as both of these nodes, we can discard one of these nodes as being potentially equivalent to, to U. And because these nodes might be eliminating one, these explored nodes might be eliminating one another in different inequalities, by the end of this process of dominance elimination, we might either remove all the explored nodes as potentially equivalent to an unexplored node, or we might just have one remaining node that's potentially equivalent. And how can we tell if this remaining node is, has exactly the same solutions as the explored node or not? That's where the sufficient condition kicks in. We know that this explored node that's candidate has all the solutions of this node are solutions of the unexplored node. The unexplored node could potentially have more solutions. And the way that we can tell if the unexplored node has more solutions or not is by making sure that the tightest right-hand side value for which every solution can be included is present in the, in the layer where we're populating uh, the decision diagram. In that way, we know that if the two if these two nodes, if one node is, is left as potentially equivalent, this node is indeed equivalent. Now, we run some experiments by pre-populating the bottom layers of the decision diagram with these nodes having the smallest right-hand side for which each solution is feasible, and so that we can ensure that these remaining candidates are always equivalent. And that has had some impact on the number of branches. So we can see the reduction, for example, from 2.9 to 2.1 in terms of the number of branches in 20 different problems in which we generate solutions. And in terms of the run times, the reduction is not as strong, but we do see, see some improvement in terms of the run times as well. So that's what I had to say for about this work. Here are some references, so papers that uh, on decision diagrams and on which we base our work. And the two last papers are papers that I've worked on and that contribute to the discussion that we're having here. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So thank you for this talk. Now we have a few minutes um, to do some questions. Do you have any questions from the audience? I think we'll only have time for one or two questions. Um, I would just like to ask about when you have this kind of uh, system, like with decision diagrams, I think you found a really good use in trying to trim the size of the search tree. I'll also be interested in, can you, given a, by, given a uh, decision diagram, can you convert it into a linear inequality, such that hopefully from the original equation, the coefficients are smaller? Hey, wow, that's, that second question is very interesting. Um, I don't know if this has been answered or not. Um, so you're basically thinking about, let's start with the decision diagram and try to come up with a linear inequality that describes this decision diagram. Well, it's like you have a linear equality turns into a decision diagram, and then you want to turn from the decision diagram back into an inequality. 
such that the coefficients are smaller, right? Because if they are smaller and they represent the same solution, then maybe your LP will be tighter. And in pseudo Boolean solving, also smaller coefficients are more preferred, for example. Like some kind of canonical representation of a I see. To be honest, I like that. Uh, I would say that to a certain extent, uh, we're doing that here because once we explore each node in the branch and bound tree, we're computing this tightest uh, right hand side that would produce the same solutions. So work, working backwards, when we're done constructing the decision diagram, we're going to find the smallest right hand side coefficients for each one of the inequalities. It doesn't mean that we have the tightest formulation, right? Because all we're doing is we're, we, the hyperplanes are still the same. We that's just- That's from the, sorry, the right-hand side, right? Yes. But the left-hand so, side is untouched. Okay. Yeah, we're just squeezing the right-hand side. So okay. it might not be the best formulation, but it's mm -hmm. at least like tighter in the right, yeah. terms of the right-hand side. So, I was just curious if you can also play around the left-hand side too, though, to reduce those as well. But I think it's we'll have a, to take that probably offline because I mean, that's a great question. During the, during the Q and A, because I think now we're running a little bit short of time. Okay, great. So thank you for this talk, and I guess I'll see you also in the Q and A. Two short talks. Uh, another one is quite fitting. It's also about decision diagrams. So I'd like to invite the speaker to start their video. Welcome to my presentation on the use of decision diagrams for finding repetition free longest common subsequences. My name is Matthias Horn and this is a joint work with Marco Kuchukanovic, Christian Blum and Günther Reidl. We want to solve the repetition free longest common subsequence problem. We have given two input strings S1 and S2 and an alphabet sigma and we want to find the longest common subsequence that is repetition free. So a subsequence is a string that can be derived from another string by deleting zero or more characters from it. A common subsequence means that the same subsequence can be derived from the input strings S1 and S2 and repetition free means that no character is allowed to appear more than once. Our work is most related to the work of Christian Blum and others. In their work the authors solved the repetition free longest common subsequence problem by transforming instances to instances of the maximum independent set problem. And here the most important thing is that they considered matchings, which we will also consider in our work. A matching is a pair of position of the input strings such that the position point to the same uh, character. So if we align the input string here in this horizontal and vertical way, then we get the grid. And matchings will be located on each point of this grid where the same character meet. Uh, matchings are important because they can appear in a common subsequence. And for instance, if we want to create the conflict graph of the maximum independent set instance, then we create for each matching a corresponding node in the conflict graph. The maximum independent set instance is then solved by the integer linear programming solver CPLEX, and the corresponding matching of the maximum independent set will also describe the repetition free longest common subsequence. Uh, the goal of this work is that we want to reduce the size of the conflict graph by finding a feasible subset of matchings and solve the maximum independent set problem with this subset of matchings. We do this by using relaxed multi-value decision diagrams in an iterative procedure, so we compile multiple relaxed MDTs to get smaller and smaller subset of matchings. A relaxed multi-value decision diagram in our context is a directed acyclic multigraph with one root node R. Uh, the nodes can be partitioned into layers and the arcs are only allowed between nodes of two consecutive layers. And each node is associated to a matching. Each path starting from the root node identifies a feasible common subsequence. This means that we create the relaxed multivalent decision diagrams in such a way that only repetition free constraints may be violated. And the length of the longest path is an upper bound to the repetition free longest common subsequence. A relaxed MDD represents therefore a discrete relaxation to our problem. To derive now a subset of matchings, we consider only matchings that are associated to any node in the relaxed MDD. 
Uh, this will give us a conflict graph which will hopefully be much smaller than the original conflict graph when we consider all matchings. To compile relaxed entities, we use an adapted version of the incremental refinement algorithm for sequencing problems from Sruer and von Höfe. Furthermore, we filter suboptimal nodes and arcs by considering also problem specific upper bounds, and we are also able to derive heuristic solutions from our compiled relaxed entities. To test our algorithm, we use two benchmark instances from the literature, which are randomly generated. We use a memory limit of 16 GB and we set the time limit to one hour for the C Black Sofa. To summarize our results, we are able to reduce the number of matchings by almost 82%, where the work from Bloom and others are only able to reduce the number of matchings by almost 49%. Furthermore, we are able to solve a little bit more than 93% of the instances to prove more optimality. Also important to note is that in almost 91% of the considered instances, it was not required to solve the miss problem anymore, because we are able to prove optimality by the upper bounds and heuristic solutions obtained from the relaxed MDD. And also we are able to obtain in more than 100 cases better results than the currently best known solution from the literature. To conclude the talk, we transformed our FLCS instances to MIS instances, which are then solved by the CPLEX solver. We use relaxed MDDs to reduce the underlying conflict graph of the MIS instances. In this way, we are able to solve almost 94% of the considered instances to prove more optimality, and we are able to obtain new state-of-the-art results in many cases. In future work, we will apply decision diagrams on other LCS-related problems. Okay, so for short, for short uh, talks, we don't have questions. And now I'd like to invite the fourth speaker, the fourth talk, so Luke, to start the video. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well today. So in this talk, I would like to discuss about our recent work on the sequential ordering problem. So in this work, we present a very simple yet competitive tree search algorithm to solve the sequential ordering problem. In a few words, the sequential ordering problem is a, uh, an asymmetric traveling salesman problem with precedence constraints. We used some iterative beam search scheme to uh, solve this problem, and we used a very simple tree structure, uh, what we call forward search. So in some sense, it's a generalization of the nearest neighbor uh, algorithm. So if I selected a few cities, where I go next? Then when, where I go next? And so on. We also used very simple bounds. So in this case, we just accumulate the, the, the cost of all the, all the edges we selected. So no minimum spanning tree, no assignment problem, and so on. And what's very funny is that the simpler the bounds, the better the performance, which is quite unusual, uh, as we believe. We also integrated some kind of uh, dynamic programming inspired printings, and this helps a lot the algorithm. And only by doing that, we were able to find new best known solutions on a very famous uh, SOP benchmark. So to get a bit more into the details, uh, the sequential ordering problem is a traveling assessment problem uh, with precedence constraints. So I want to start, uh, for instance, uh, from city A, visit every possible cities, in this case B, C, and D, and I want to finish uh, by city A. And also I will have some precedence constraints. So in this graph, you can see that uh, A must precede every other city, D must precede E and C, and so on. So, regarding the benchmark, there's a famous one called the SOP lib. It contains many uh, large instances from 200 uh, to 700 cities. And there are se seven open instances in this benchmark. And obviously, the sequential ordering problem uh, have, been consider have been considered a lot in the literature. So among the most popular methods out there, you can find some uh, branch and cuts, you can find some MDDs combined with uh, constraint programming. And regarding heuristics or meta-heuristics, you will find, for instance, uh, the LKH free solver, 
some uh, ant colony optimization with simulated annealing, and mostly a lot of local search uh, with the free ops move. So regarding our algorithm and the search procedure we used, so we used some iterative beam search. Let me first describe beam search real quick. So the idea is to explore the tree level by level. And we will limit the size of the number of nodes open at the same time uh, to, f to some limit. Here in this, exa in, in this example, uh, I set it to three. So I open the root. Uh, I open the first level because there's less than three nodes at the same time. Then at this level, there's too many nodes. So I will keep only the, the best three of them. So in this case, it would be these ones. Then I can open the next level. I have too many nodes. I have to remove some. And I do that again and again until I finished exploring the tree. Obviously, this algorithm is not complete. I may miss some solutions. So what we propose is to do some uh, very uh, simple iterative scheme. So I start with a beam search of size 1. Basically, it's doing a greedy. Then when it's over, I run it again, but this time uh, with a size of 2. When it finishes, I run, ag run it again with a size of 4, then 8, then 16, and so on. And uh, when I don't have any more time, I stop. Or when I explore the tree to totally, so without doing any heuristic cut, I can also stop because here I found the optimal solution. And by doing this iterative beam search algorithm, combined with very simple bounds and prunings, we can basically get very good solutions and even improve some uh, most of the uh, open instances. Here I show some, the some results we got. And overall, this algorithm, we found it very efficient to solve uh, constraint instances of the sequential ordering problem. So it complements well local search or MIP approach that, work w that works well on um, instances that are not very constrained by the precedence constraints. So thank you all again for your attention. And uh, please feel free to ask questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank everybody for this session. So now we have reached the end and we only have one or two minutes before the next session. So we won't have, we won't have any questions now. And so I invite you just to proceed to the next session and then ask questions during the Q&A. Thank you.